Awesome. Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Um, well, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Sherry Kirkfold, and uh, I sent a little um, bio for Stephanie to introduce me, but <laughs> I guess that won't happen. Um, so uh, let's see, I guess I've been working uh, as a naturalist uh, in the BC Park System since uh, the late 70s. Also worked in Parks Canada and CRD Parks. I worked at the Vancouver Museum as the curator of natural history, and I was at public programs in the Royal BC Museum. I taught in three colleges, heritage interpretation and environmental stewardship. I ran my own business doing interpretation, um, headed up the uh, provincial interpretation program for BC Parks, <laughs> there was such a thing. Um, so, <laughs> well, there's Stephanie, we've got her Hi. back. I think I pretty much said everything I said. You're doing great. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, uh, I, I'm on my telephone. I got on in, on my own account on the phone because BC Nature wouldn't let me. Um, join without a password that I can't access. So apologies to everybody for starting late. And thank you so much to um, everyone helping to troubleshoot and to Anne for uh, stepping in. And I do have your your um, your intro here that I could read as well. Um, Sherry has a fantastic um, wealth of experience um, that she's mentioned already. Um, and uh, I can, would you like me to read more of what that, you, that I have here? I say was the um, ecotourism bit. So I've been doing that since the mid nineties. Um, and that's, um, so I also lead some international tours, but that's pretty much it. <laughs> okay, well, I'm gonna read what I have here because okay. it's, uh, it's great. So in 1994, Sherry began working on ecotourism vessels on the coast of BC and Alaska. And now in semi-retirement, continues to do these trips as well as lead international nature tours to countries that have included Iceland, Cuba, Belize, Guatemala, Costa Rica, Honduras, Scotland to Iceland by boat and others. Sherry is also a certified bear viewing guide, but not a bear biologist. And she's happy to share what she has observed over her many years of viewing bears. And I also just wanna thank Sherry and mention that she's also now the secretary um, and on the board of the Vancouver Natural History Society. So thanks so much, Sherry. <laughs> um, thanks a lot, Stephanie. Okay, so I guess I'll just uh, jump straight into uh, share screen. And... Okay, is that working? Can you see my title slide? Looks great. Okay, great. Um, so tonight's talk is about uh, coastal bears. Um, but before we get into the coastal bears, I'll just give a little bit of an overview of bears of the world. So on the top row, we've got the American black bear, which is the most numerous of all the bears, the grizzly or the brown bear, which um, spans the greatest territory being both in uh, North America and Eurasia, the polar bear from up north, and the spectacle of bear from South America. So those are all the um, American bears. And then the bottom row is the Asian bears, the panda bear from China, the Asiatic black bear and the sun bear and the omnivorous or sorry, the insectivorous uh, sloth bear from India. So eight species of bears is uh, pretty much what we have. And they've been rather successful as a um, a group of animals having been around in some form or another for about 5 million years. And these are the fossil remains of the uh, giant cave bear, which lived in Eurasia until about 40,000 years ago. But today's talk is about coastal bears. And here we are in the beautiful um, coast of British Columbia. This in particular is the Great Bear Rainforest, which is where I do most of my um, bear guiding. And in this area, bears are very important uh, to the indigenous cultures. This is a, a piece from inside one of the big houses on the coast. On the right hand, you see the black bear. And on the left hand, you see the brown bear. So both being represented here. Uh, here's a poll from Haida Gwaii representing the bear mother story. So you can see the face of the bear. And then if you look at the two paws, 
you'll see the little faces of the cubs in the paws. So bears have been very, very important in indigenous cultures on the coast. So how do we tell the difference between a grizzly bear and a black bear? Um, you can't just use color and size. So you have to kind of look at a variety of things. In general, a grizzly bear will have a big hump on its shoulder because it's a digging animal. So it has those big muscles up there to give it lots of strength for digging. It also has a bit of a dished face, whereas the black bear is quite straight, both on its back and its face. Uh, grizzly bears tend to have nice rounded ears and black bears are a little bit more pointed. And the claws of the grizzly bear are quite a bit bigger than the black bear. And I'll just talk about the tracks on the next slide. It's, it's not all that easy to tell the difference between the back tracks sometimes, depending on how clear the print is, but you can usually get a pretty good idea from the front feet. Um, generally, if you drew a straight line under the toes, that would be straight under a grizzly bear. And you can see that those claw marks are way out front from those long claws. With a black bear, they're a little bit more curved and the baby toe would fit underneath that line. Now, given that this is not an interactive <laughs> presentation because I can't hear any of you, here I'd normally ask, um, so what kind of tracks are these? I think the best, uh, so mother and cubs, um, I think the best one to look at is the lower uh, left there. And you can see it's quite rounded and the track, the claws aren't out very front. So out far very front. So um, that being a black bear and this being the grizzly with the very straight line under the toes and those claws way out front. So when you're watching bears, there are a number of things that um, you need to think about. Um, one of the best things to do if you're watching bears is to be in a group. Um, that's really the safest way to be watching bears. Of course, um, we don't want to see bears become habituated to food. So we don't want to feed them either intentionally or unintentionally by leaving um, garbage and food available to them. We want to avoid surprising bears. So if you're in a, a dense forest area, you might not want to see a bear at that point. So you might want to be clapping your hands and calling out that you're, you're there just to give them notice. Now, the next one where I say um, give way when necessary, that really depends on where you are. Um, here in British Columbia, I think pretty much that's what people go by is if a bear is coming down the trail, you step off and let the bear go by. However, a number of the sites in Alaska will ask you to keep the trail and let the bears go around. So you just kind of have to know the um, protocols for the place that you're um, viewing in. And really important, don't run. So if you're the kind of person who, if you think you're going to flee in terror upon seeing a bear, um, probably better to stay away from them altogether. The other thing to think about is um, be aware of your surroundings and what's going on around you. So you can see upper right, there's a group of people probably intently watching a bear. Um, when they've got this really beautiful one uh, right behind them, because you really don't want to end up in a situation like this. So we're going to talk a little bit about the nature of bears. They are very uh, curious and intelligent animals. So one of the things that you'll find uh, in areas where bears are, are places where they place their feet time after time, and this is called a bear stomp. So these are often uh, located near to bear marked trees, and it's believed that they leave scent in the um, footprints here. And sometimes these bear stomps will get really, really deep. Now, my observations are is that they're not just around bear marked trees, because I've seen bear stomps go a long ways uh, along a river. So they can be be quite um, uh, significant in their in their length, but um, you know this is a really well worn one. And if we are looking at bear stomps, we try not to walk in them and disturb the scent that they're leaving in those footprints. So I mentioned bear mark trees. So bears will uh, scratch trees. They'll reach up really high and scratch a tree. It's kind of like a calling card. There's a little um, a little post office here. Who's who's coming and who's going. 
Um, the other thing you'll find in these uh, trees that bears like are um, is sometimes you'll find bear hair because they rub on these trees. <laughs> oh, look at that. <laughs> you see that? So that was a very uh, rainy day for bear watching. Um, but here's a bear who's done so much rubbing on a tree that it's actually worn all the food, uh, fur right off of its back. Now, um, sometimes we come across areas that are signed. Um, most of this research has um, on a rest. I'm not sure if it's coming back or not, but between uh, up until 2017, pretty much anywhere you went on the coast, you'd find one of these signs and a bear hair trap in behind. So these um, bear hair traps will have a barbed wire fence around them. And you can see the pile of sticks and things in the middle. Here's another example. And this has got some kind of a scent in it, but there's no food reward for bears. It just attracts them to come and investigate this. And in so doing, they pass underneath the um, barbed wire. Um, sometimes there'll also be a scent that's hanging up above. Um, we call it a non-reward scent. And the idea is to catch some of the bear's hair. Now also in this setup is a camera so that when the hair is collected, the camera catches a picture of the bear. And from this hair, we can learn all kinds of really interesting things. So um, one thing is we can look at the mercury levels and determine how much fish makes up part of their diet. We can look at the cortisol levels and determine how stressed the bears are. And of course, we figure out their DNA, their gender, um, what they're eating. Uh, so lots of really great information uh, comes. And, and this is a really non-invasive way of studying bears. There's no tranquilizing and collaring and all of that kind of stuff. We can learn a lot about the populations and even where they're going if they get their hair caught in this trap and then in another one in another area. So um, some really interesting research just with bear hair. So in terms of what bears eat, um, they're classified with the carnivores, but their diet um, is really much more, uh, they're omnivores. But their digestive system isn't really well suited to plants, like they don't have the four stomachs that a cow, a cow has, for example. So they um, have to eat that vegetation kind of when it's at its prime and it's most uh, useful because they really need to get fat before they den for the winter. So in the spring, bears emerge from their dens and they're hungry. And so they feed mostly on newly emerging greens and estuaries are one of the first places to green up, although they'll also come down to the coast for herring spawn as well. So here's a beautiful um, estuary here, all nice and green. And if you come in the spring, um, the bears will kind of look a little bit like cows on the landscape. And these spring sedges that they're eating um, are very high in protein early in the year. I've heard 28% protein. So they, they do get a good, good um, amount of nutrition from eating this. So I always wanted to get a picture of a bear with sedge in his mouth, and I finally did. Um, but it was a funny day. We'd been out looking for bears for a good chunk of the day and hadn't seen anything and finally resigned ourselves to going back to the boat when uh, one of my guests calls out and goes, is that a horse? And uh, so we looked and it was this beautiful bear and we got to watch her um, eat the sedges there. So you can see also where they've cropped them if you're just walking around in the estuaries, uh, really good food source in the spring.
Another spring plant is skunk cabbage or swamp lantern. And these plants can actually create biological heat and melt their, melt their way up through the snow. Um, bears will spend a lot of time digging the roots. And it's, it's almost considered as bear farming because as they dig the roots, some of them break up and they kind of like plant new plants. So a little bit of bear farming the skunk cabbage. And uh, so here's some uh, places where they've been digging the skunk cabbage. And one thing that you'll learn from my presentation is that I have a bit of a fascination with bear poop. So here is the um, first one. This is skunk cabbage bear poop. Now, when you're looking at bear poop, you are learning about what they're eating, but you're not learning about what they ate because all you're looking at is what they really didn't use. So if it's like a good source of meat or something, you're not gonna find that in the scat. You, you find all the stuff that they didn't use. Now, one of the plants that uh, is also used a lot um, is a common food plant for indigenous peoples. This one's called the Northern rice root. And if you take a look at the root, it does look kind of like little grains of rice. And this is a good starchy uh, food. In Victoria here, we have um, a plant of the same genus called the chocolate lily, and which was also used as a food plant here. So something that they'll be digging. And I just happened to one day get quite close to a bear that was digging roots. Oh, just before I get to that, um, they, they kind of do rototilling in the estuary. So they, they dig um, a lot, turn up the soil, it's kind of like uh, how we do our gardens, we turn them over. So lots of rototilling here. And here's my up close um, encounter with a digging bear. So nice vegetative poop here, just uh, lots of plant material. So that's a lot of what you see in the springtime. There's also a few spring berries around, such as the salmon berries. And then in summer, the opportunities for food really opens up. Um, bears might move to higher ground. And I like to use the term opportunivore because basically they eat whatever they find. And that can include roots, plants, berries, grubs, seafood, meat and what have you. Here's a bear on the coast looking for crabs. And it's multitasking, you can see it's going out one end to the other. This is a bear in Hidegwai, so it's the largest of all the black bears. And watch it just turn over this rock. So if you look at the, this is quite an old poop, but if you look at what's in this one, if you look right in the top center, you'll see the little um, claw with the, uh, or the crab shell with the polka dots. So that's a purple shore crab. And then this next one, it's got much longer, narrower crab feet in it. So I think it might be some kind of a kelp crab, but lots of seafood. Now uh, this one, um, it's going to, I was really far away, it's going to be look a little bit seasick, but I will um, mention just where it's eating the barnacles. So lot, bears seem to spend a lot of time eating barnacles. So of course you're all wondering what barnacle poop looks like. And there it is. Now imagine eating all of those sharp shells going down your throat, through your stomach and out the other end. Um, but there they are, a beautiful barnacle poop. 
and they do eat um, marine mammals. I don't know that they're doing much hunting of them, but they probably do get opportunities to eat um, dead seals. And here is a bear poop with, uh, you can see two seal claws in the middle. And then all of that gray uh, fluffy stuff around there, that's all seal fur. So that was really interesting find. Also in summer, they're digging for um, other plant roots. And one of the ones they eat a lot of is the lupin. So we're back to the nice, neat um, vegetative poops there. Now, salal berries kind of cross the boundary between summer and fall, depending on exactly where you are on the coast. But these really do make the very best of bear poops. I think you'll all think, uh, you know, agree that that's quite a gorgeous color there. And this next one, um, I don't know, I think this might be my favorite one of all time. We've gone into a little river, a little salmon stream to look for bears and came out without having seen a bear, but this was there and it hadn't been there when we went in. So it was very, very fresh. And they will eat uh, mammals as well. So uh, I was out on a beach with my group one day and this mother and cub just kept walking towards us and I wasn't really happy with what they were doing. So we all spread out a little bit and made ourselves look bigger. And the bears did exactly what we wanted them to do. They turned and went into the bush. So later on that evening, I'm on the boat and one of my guests asks, is that the bear bleating? And then another person says, no, it's a bear riding a, riding a deer. Now I know this is a really grainy photo, but it's the best I could do from the distance I was. But we watched this bear get on top of this deer and you can see it's got antlers and everything. And it uh, fought with it for quite a while. There were hooves thrashing and flipping and uh, eventually the, the deer died and the bear dragged it up the beach a little ways, disappeared, came back, dragged it up a little more, disappeared, and then finally came back with cub and the two of them uh, feasted on the fresh meat. So that was definitely one of the more interesting <laughs> experiences I, of observing bears that I've ever seen. Finally, fall comes around and this is when bears really need to fatten up because they begin the stage called hyperphagia, which basically translates to continuous eating. So many of the coastal bears will move to the salmon streams, but they'll also continue to eat uh, berries and other things that are available. So some of those other things are the uh, Pacific crab apples, the wild crab apples. They're very tiny, but they do taste very much like our domestic crab apples. So here's a little black bear cub up in a crab apple tree feasting away. And across the river is a little grizzly cub also up in a tree feasting on crab apples. Um, and this, this next one's in a different place, but there's an adult bear uh, eating crab apples. So they seem to really love eating these crab apples, but I'm not really sure why, because if you look at the bear poop, um, those crab apples seem to come out pretty unscathed. So here's another example, uh, you know, the stems and all are still there. So they spend a lot of time eating something they don't seem to digest. But uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about salmon because that's really the important thing for bears on the coast. And these fish have left the stream that they were born in, gone around in the Pacific Ocean and found their ways back to their natal stream, the stream in which they were born. And this is when the feasting begins. So all of the bears um, will eat salmon. So here's a black bear, here's a spirit bear, and here's a grizzly bear, all coming to eat salmon. So I've been watching these bears for a long time and I've started to observe that they have lots of different fishing techniques. So here's one of them, this is called well, I've called it, I've named these things myself, peering. So this bear is standing up on a log and it's peering down into the river until it sees a salmon that it might like to eat. Another example of peering 
is this bear that's peering in a hole. And when a fish comes into that hole, it simply drops into the hole and gets the fish. And this bear also does peering, but it's from a standing position. Um, so this bear So you can see it does rain a fair bit in the Great Bear Rainforest. So this bear you know, spent the better part of a day doing that. And we were kind of hoping it would move on for maybe because that none of the other bears would likely come into that uh, stream while it was um, located there. Now, these are low, what I'm calling low energy feeding styles. So the bear is not expending much. It's getting a lot of food value for very little effort. Now, believe it or not, this is a fishing bear. Looks like it's having a little nap along the stream. Um, notice its face and its paws are nice and clean. And then, wham, it snatches a fish out of the river, eats it, and then goes back to fishing position. So uh, now you can see the bloody feet and, uh, and nose. So that, I call that one the napping uh, strategy. Now this next bear has an even lower energy one. This is the sleeping strategy. So this bear has found a nice comfy spot on the riverbank and settles down for a nice nap. Now what's going on is the tide is rising. So once the tide rises and floats the bear, it floats it right into a little salmon pool where it picks out a fish and eats it. Now this is also a fishing bear. Um, if you ever get a chance to see the BBC's um, series called Earth's Greatest Events, the episode on salmon, they have some wonderful underwater footage of what this bear is doing. And it's scrabbling on the bottom with its feet and looking, feeling around for a fish. And when it finds something to eat, it just brings it up and uh, there it has it. So another fishing strategy. Now this bear has a little bit more precarious position. Now, if you've seen the Great Bear IMAX film, I'm pretty sure this location was featured in it and pretty much the same cast of characters as was in that film because up above here is a mom and cub waiting patiently um, for a chance at this really prime fishing spot. Now notice over on the left, there's a beautiful coho salmon that's shooting its way up this waterfall. So this bear is there and when it gets a chance to grab a fish, it just reaches in. Now it's got to be careful because it's a long ways down, pulls out the fish and it's going to eat that fish in that spot because it's not going to give up that fishing spot. So has this fish, has a nice meal out of that fish and then goes on to continue fishing. And I've just got a little video clip here. Some of them get away. Now we're getting into some more energetic types of fishing. This is called uh, fish chasing. So you're running down the stream chasing fish and you can see the two salmon that are fleeing in front of this bear. And here's a little family group that is uh, fish chasing. And then um, here's another bear that was uh, fish chasing. So we were out in a, an estuary and the captain called and told us that there was a bear in, it, in the area. So we found a good spot from which we thought we could um, see if anything happened. And this bear came running down the river. And we of course all knew that it was fish chasing. 
but all the captain could see from the boat was a bear heading, running at full speed towards his group. And he told me later that his only thought was paperwork. Anyway, we had a really nice time watching this uh, beautiful bear um, chasing fish. But this is my favorite um, bear of all time. I call this bear super, super bear and you'll find out why shortly. So it would climb up onto this rock and launch itself into space doing a complete belly flop. And then it would climb back up and it would belly flop again. And then finally I got the picture where super bear, it really was flying through the air belly flopping and uh, wasn't really doing all that well at catching fish. So um, very energetic uh, technique for very low um, reward for food. So all of these uh, salmon that are being eaten by the bears um, are being dragged up into the bush or pooped out of the bears into the forests. We now know contribute a lot to growing big trees on the coast. But that is a whole nother topic that we won't go into today. So I'm going to talk lastly on the, the sort of cycle of the year on the winter time. So bears lie dormant for the winter. And you know, there's been a lot of debate as to whether they're true hibernators or not. I think now people do agree that they are true hibernators. They, they don't go into as deep of a, a drop of body temperature of, of say squirrels or something, but they do lower their body temperature, their heart and breath rate. They don't go anywhere. They lose a lot of body weight. And it's here that the females give birth to, to, uh, to however many um, fist sized cubs and she nurses them until it's time to emerge. Now, these are not my um, direct photos. This was a, a spirit bear named Apollo who was somewhere near Terrace or Kitimat and they had a remote camera on his den. So I was able to take these pictures from my computer. Um, but it does give me a chance to talk just a little bit about bear dens because there's a lot of concern about our loss of bear dens these days. So um, there's a woman named uh, Helen Davis who's studying um, bear dens and she's done all kinds of creative work in trying to cre create artificial dens and with you know some success and some not success. success. Um, but there's a, a real movement to try and get bear dens protected because without them, um, we will have difficulty uh, continuing the species. Now, while they're in the den, um, so there is, by the way, a place in British Columbia called Tappan. And I wonder if they know about this. Um, it used to, you used to hear that bears would plug up their, their bums, um, that they would take hair and plant material and foot pads and stuff and stuff it up. Um, we now know that that's not the case, but there is some stuff that uh, accumulates inside the, um, the bear at, at the end that becomes dry and hard. So it is kind of like a little plug. And that basically keeps the den clean all winter because they're not uh, urinating or defecating. So before I knew this more new information, I came across a situation like this. Now this is an old photo, it's a scan slide. I've never seen anything quite like it since. That is my hat up in the top left, and the rest is a big pile of bear poop. So my first thought was, well, I wonder if that's what happens when the plug comes out. But I was able to talk to a bear biologist who assured me that no, this was just the place where um, bears pooped a lot. So 
um, for someone who's interested in bear poop, this was like the jackpot. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the different types of bears on the coast. Um, so the first one I'll talk about is the grizzly bear. Um, I'm going to use grizzly synonymous with um, brown bear. Um, some people differentiate with brown bears being salmon eating bears on the coast, grizzlies being in the interior. Others differentiate with brown bears being in the US and grizzly bears being in Canada. Um, but for my purposes, I'm just going to call them grizzly bears. I think this photo would make a really good uh, caption this um, contest. So the, the stats, these, these stats, um, they're very flexible um, because if you look in different books, you'll find different numbers. And we know that the big Kodiak bears go over a thousand pounds, but just roughly um, males, four to 800 pounds, females, three to 400. They live 20 to 25 years. They can run more than 50 kilometers an hour. Their typical litter size is one to three cubs and cubs stay with mom for three years. So that's different than black bears. Now I mentioned, um, you know, size. Uh, I at one point had um, the interest to research through a bunch of the hunting rec records. And I picked some random years. And in each case, the year that I picked, fully one third of the bears killed in the hunting uh, program were females. And you're not supposed to kill females. And that's because people don't take enough time to really determine the gender. So this is a female bear and she is big. I mean, look at the size of her. So you're only gonna be able to tell the gender of the bear if it has a cub with it, that's obvious. Or if you see it pee out the back, um, then it's a female. If it pees out the front, it's a male. And very, very rarely do you get a little glimpse of the bits that show you it's a male. That, that rarely happens. So um, this was a big male. We, we don't tend to see as many of the big males when we're viewing because they tend to be hanging out in the really best fishing spots, which are not necessarily places we get to. So um, a really nice big male there. Mostly what we tend to see are the females and the cubs. Now it was this mom and cub where I finally fell in love with bears. I started out my naturalist career being interested in botany. Um, and then I got really interested in tide pools and things like lichens and other things. But bears, you know, other people were interested in bears. And that was until I met this mom and cub. I spent a couple of hours with them uh, we watched them do everything, swim, nap, eat, drink, sleep, um, pretty much all of it. And I really fell in love with bears that day. And the really neat thing for me was that I got to see that mom and cub over the next uh, couple of years. So here's cub when she was two years old and she's got really distinctive ears, uh, the little light and uh, dark in the middle. And then here she is at uh, three years old. And I was feeling a little bit sad because at this point I knew um, this would be the last time I'd see her with mom. And I've been kind of, and I knew she was a female because one of the bear biologists uh, told me she was. Um, I knew it was gonna be the last year I'd see her with mom. And I was, I've been kind of looking for that cub ever since. Um, I don't really think I found her, but uh, hopefully she and her offspring are, are out there somewhere. So moms and cubs are, are really fun to watch. And what we've noticed is that they seem pretty comfortable uh, with people in some of the areas that are regularly viewed. And it's almost like we're offering a babysitting service because they, uh, you know, this is me supposing what they're thinking, but um, they feel uh, safe with the people around because the big males are less likely to come around where the people are. And I actually did see a big male snatch a cub one time. Uh, it was a very, very brief thing that the, the big bear snatched the cub, shook it and disappeared with it off into the forest. And all of us were standing there with our jaws down. Um, but the mums and cubs do tend to be out in the estuaries, um, which is you know fine by me. I love watching um, mums and cubs. So we get some really great viewing opportunities. And this was a mom and cub that just happened to park themselves right by where we were sitting in our little boat. So 
kids came over and ate some salmon right in front of us. This bear, I think it has kind of a mean look to it, but that's again, just me uh, sur surmising. And that is the end of the uh, grizzly bear section. And so we'll move on to the black bears. Now, black bears are not very well named um, because they're not necessarily black. They can be black, brown, cinnamon, blonde, cream, white, or blue. They tend to weigh somewhere between two and 600 pounds. They live for about 20 years. Again, usually two or three cubs, but they only stay with mum for two years. So here's a mum and cub that are the typical black color that gives the black bear its name. Um, here's one that I, a lot of them have this white patch on their chest, but I thought this one looked rather like a bow tie. So quite a snazzy little mark there. Now here's a mum with several cubs and you can see they're all different colors. There's one that's quite black, one that's quite blonde, um, one that's kind of mixture of colors. And then it's hard to see, but she's got another one closer. She had four cubs. Here's a bear that's got a lot of cinnamon color in it. And of course the spirit bear with the white coat. Now I've never seen one in person, but I did take this picture of a stuffed glacier bear. Um, they are also very white like the spirit bears. And when they're out on the glaciers, the ice reflects a blue color and, and that's what they get their name, the blue or the glacier bear. So lots of fun uh, watching black bears on the stream. Again, mums and cubs being lots of fun to watch. So here's a uh, mum teaching a cub how to fish and cubs paying lots of attention and eventually shows up with its catch, a lovely dead fish. So um, very beautiful bears. Again, you can see the white patch on this one. Fishing. And I, I love the lipstick look on some of these bears, the bloody mouth. Otherwise they look pretty neat. Lots of different personalities that you see in these bears. And that is the end of the black bear section. So now we'll go on to uh, the spirit bear which is a black bear, but I'm giving it its own section. Um, now the spirit bear was very revered, revered by the First Nations, and this is in um, another village's um, cultural center, this painting of the spirit bear. And they have a number of legends um, about the bear, of which I don't uh, you know, tend to tell much in the way of First Nations legends, because um, I believe that belongs with those people. But the, the gist of it is that um, these bears were thought to be, become white during the Ice Age. And since then, the creator has um, given every 10th bear a white coat to remind us of those times. Um, but there are other, other more, um, more in-depth legends as well. So they are not albino bears. They are a white face of the black bear from a recessive gene and that gene is the same gene as the one that gives red hair in humans. Now the heart of that gene is on Gribble Island and a significant population on Princess Royal Island and some in the surrounding area. So basically it's been said that one in three to four bears on Gribble Island is white. There aren't a large number of bears there and one in 10 on Princess Royal. Um, but I'm not really sure that that's being held in, in uh, nowadays. Since they've been doing those bear hair studies, we believe that there are far fewer um, white bears than previously thought. I think the current population estimates are somewhere between one and 300. So we used to say 400 to 1,000, so quite a, quite a bit less. So here's a uh, black bear and a white bear on the same stream. So they basically are the same um, bear. Here's a couple of white bears that uh, were both fishing and they seemed really comfortable in each other's presence. The thing with the salmon streams is there's so much food um, that some of the squabbling does get less, although it does still happen. 
And uh, so, you know, if, if it's true that the bears became white because of the ice age, why are there still white bears? Why has that gene persisted? So there was some interesting um, research done where they had students dress up in white suits and in black suits. And it turned out that the footwear was quite important. Uh, it couldn't be, a white suit couldn't have black boots. So I think they had green ones, um, but they would observe what the fish were doing. They were measuring light and uh, determined that um, if, you know, th think if, you, if you're a fish and you're looking up and you see something white, it's not as likely to bother you as a big black thing hulking over there. Um, so just speaking about the boots, notice that this bear's toenails are also white. So it's believed that the white bears have better success fishing salmon during the day, and that fishing success kind of evens out with the black bears at night. But that's one of the reasons why it's thought that this white gene has persisted. So again, lots of fishing going on here. Um, now, every now and again, we go off on a little explore and go up some random place we've never been before and find something. And in this case, we found this bear trap. And it says property of Al Oming, who had a game farm up near Edmonton. And so he had come down or someone from his uh, group had come down to try and get a white bear for the game farm. Um, now it was found out and this was uh, stopped. So I guess they just closed up the bear trap, but didn't bother to remove it. So it still sits there. Now, um, I'm, I'm a little bit of a romantic. Uh, I have ideas about how things are supposed to be. Um, for example, uh, I was gonna find a glass ball and it would be of course on a beautiful sandy beach and it would be cast up just above the, the water line, the last rays of sunset glinting off of it. But reality was I found my first glass ball 14 feet back in the Salal digging around in the bush. Well, with my first spirit bear, it was going to be emerging out of the woods and it would briefly look at me as it walked on by. And, and this is not my first spirit bear, but um, this is basically what happened. The spirit bear did just that. It came out of the bush and it was trailing two meters of tapeworm out of its butt. So not quite as romantic as what I had planned, but uh, it's really fun watching these bears. And I've been really lucky over the years. This is the only cub that I've seen and just traveling by on in our big boat and happened to look up and see this little guy up in the tree. So it wasn't even you know out looking for, for one at the, the time. Now this little bit of coastline is uh, known for bears and I've scoured this coastline, I don't know how many times looking for a spirit bear seen lots and lots of black bears and this is Gribble Island. So, you know, after I was at about eight black bears, I'm going, well, if, you know, one in four is white, I should be due for a white one. So finally it paid off and I got to see my white bear there. And then this little waterfall is um, up the valley there is where I saw my first spirit bear, but we can't go in there anymore. However, the bears are known to visit this waterfall and I can't tell you how many times I've gone past this waterfall. Every time I go down there, we look in this waterfall. And finally, this was just a couple of years ago, I saw my spirit bear in that waterfall. And then there are times when you're not even looking for bears or spirit bears anyway. This is a picture way up in a deep fjord, up in the Fjordland, Fjordlands Conservancy, Conservancy. And one of my guests says, Sherry, there's a bear swimming in the channel. And I look and I, of course, we're going to look for grizzly bears. They say, oh yeah, it's a grizzly bear. And they say, oh, it's awfully pale. And of course, me knowing everything says, oh yeah, the grizzly bears here tend to have really blonde faces. And then I'm starting to look at this bear and I'm going, that's not a grizzly bear. And then it got to the shore, climbed out and there was a spirit bear where I really didn't expect to see one. This was one of my favorite bears. Sadly, he's no longer with us, a ringer. So just to have a little look at.
very lovely bear. He got his name because he was missing the equivalent of his uh, ring finger on his front foot. And this is Boss, um, so named because he does tend to be the boss of this particular stream. Very beautiful bear. And just some other random bears. Uh, they all have different personalities. Lots of fun to watch. This one had a very pink nose. Uh, it was kind of an unusual looking bear. And this has got to be like a lot of people's very favorite bear. Her name was Ma'a, which means grandmother. Um, she hasn't been seen in a couple of years, so we think she's she's gone now. Um, she, but her real distinctive feature were those rings around her eyes. Um, one person said they thought it was from bug bites. Uh, I don't really know why she had those rings, but it was very distinctive. This one uh, is Warrior. I got to see Warrior this year for less than a minute and I didn't take any pictures because I was just, she was up in the forest and I was just working really hard to make sure all my guests uh, got to see her. But uh, another lovely uh, female bear in spite of her name. And Strawberry is still around as well. She's another female um, spirit bear. So it's good that we have the, this strong component of female bears um, to hopefully keep the, um, the white gene uh, persisting. And that is the end of the spirit bear section and also the end of my talk. Um, but I will just mention a couple of other things because I did put in my little um, description um, that you might find out how you can help bears. So I think one of the most brilliant um, methods of bear conservation has been done by Raincoast Conservation um, Foundation. They have um, purchased the bear guide outfitting territories in a lot of areas. So if you look at the um, pale uh, tan color on the map, those are areas where there are guide outfitters. Now they can't hunt grizzly bears anymore, but they can still uh, hunt other things. The big green area is all of the guide outfitting territories that Raincoast has purchased. So they now control all of the hunting rights in those areas, which means all of the carnivores are protected in those areas. So they are now attempting to buy the blue area of the south, the southern great bear, um, and you can see they've raised 30% of the funds that they need for that. So if any of you are interested in uh, protecting coastal carnivores, um, that's a, a good avenue. The other thing I will mention is that um, we now have bear viewing licenses because the guide outfitters would always say, well, look at how much revenue we bring into the province um, through our licenses and, and et cetera. So we've now um, got bear viewing licenses. So we can say, well, look at how much revenue that bear viewing provides um, into the, uh, the government. So I think this is another really brilliant little um, method of conservation. So I'll stop there. I'm going to get out of the uh, stop sharing here. There we go. Thank you so much, Sherry. <laughs> I'm so glad your videos worked that we got that sound going. That was that amazing photos and videos and uh, love your knowledge of the bears and what it incredible job you have to be able to go out there and share that with people. So I'm back online. Thankfully, my internet's working again. So um, so I'll just open up the floor to questions. Feel free to unmute and turn on your video if you would like to ask some questions um, or please um, enter them in the chat. And I see we have a question from Margie. Yeah, um, you're muted. So you just need to unmute. There you go. Hi, Sherry. Um, I'm wondering if the uh, if the white bears, if leucistic is the same as the recessive gene, do they mean the same thing? Or, uh, you know, leucistic is in birds, uh, but I didn't know whether it was, it was the same thing or not. I, I don't think so. I, I don't really know that for sure. And hi, I haven't seen you for a long time. <laughs> um, because I think the the um, it's the red haired gene is really um, what gives the white bear its coat, and I think uh, the leucistic is um, more um, the, the pigment 
kind of uh, condition. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, wondering if you could share how we can go on tour with you to observe the bears. So I work for a couple couple of companies. So I'll, I'll talk about those first. I work with uh, Maple Leaf Adventures. Uh, their office is here in Victoria. And I work with Blue Water Adventures and their office is in North Vancouver. Um, there are a, a number of other companies um, doing these kind of trips off the top of my head. I can think of uh, Mothership Adventures that does uh, Mothership kayaking. Um, there's um, the Great Bear 2 boat. There's uh, Outer Shores Expedition, which is also a Victoria company. Um, uh, I'm just trying to think of the name of the company that had the Ocean Light 2, uh, which burned down last uh, summer. They have a new boat, but I, I can't think of the name. Um, so there's there's several companies that do it. I think if you look on the Commercial Bear Viewing Association's website, um, they would have a list of the companies there that are doing bear viewing. I think that might be um, a good way of uh, finding access. But I work for Maple Leaf and Blue Water, <laughs> both great companies. Uh, Sherry, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, uh, I seem to remember reading uh, years ago that the black bears uh, tended to eat the belly fat and that the wolves tend to eat the head of salmon. So I was watching to see if they were eating the belly fat, but I didn't seem to see that. Is that uh, not true? Well, uh, certainly true what you said about wolves. Uh, wolves do eat the heads. And uh, one of the uh, ideas behind that is that um, there's a parasite in the rest of the fish that the wolves avoid by eating just the heads. Now, bears tend to eat different things at different times. If, if salmon are all in fresh and there's tons of them, they might just go for the roe and the brain. Um, and then later on, they'll get a little bit more picky. They'll, they'll eat uh, you know, the belly and whatever. I think you saw Ringer there, he was eating the whole fish. <laughs> and then late in the season where um, things are, uh, you know, mostly dead salmon and they're, they're kind of getting a bit desperate, they'll eat just the mankiest old bit of remaining dead salmon that you could ever imagine. Yeah. So um, certainly true that the wolves are much more picky about what they eat, but the, the bears, it kind of goes by um, what's available at the time. They, they seem to be sort of tearing the salmon apart. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, here's another um, interesting question from the chat about um, how does the bear tourism affect the bears? Is there a limit to the number of tourists before the bears um, are detrimentally affected? Okay, great, great question. Um, I've got a couple of things to, to mention about that. So we have a, the word habituation, which is usually used with food habituation and is a negative thing. Um, there's also habituation to people, which does happen in a lot of the bear viewing sites. So people are very regulated as to where they go in this particular river, they can go to that spot. And that way the bears know where the people are and the people know, you know, everyone's aware of what the other thing is doing. So the bears know what the people are doing and, um, also a lot of those places are restricted so we have to have a permit so there's only one boat per day uh, in um, one system in one case um, in one one case the spirit fair viewing lodge can access the middle of the day but we can only access the early morning or the late afternoon um, and another one there now um, it, last year it was we could only go up one side of the river on one day and the other side of the river on the other day and then this year they opened it up so you could go on either side of the river but again um, restricting it to um, you know how not uh, very very small numbers of people i myself don't see negative impacts from what we're doing uh, we're watching the bears don't seem to be um, disrupted from what they're doing there we're watching them do what they do they eat they walk they sleep they nap um, 
And uh, so I think in that situation, um, it's pretty good. Now I have been to some of the bear viewing areas in Alaska where there's a lot more um, people going in. And again, it seems like the bears just, they know where the people are and they just go about their business. So I think um, as long as we can keep things where we're not giving the bears unexpected experiences that uh, it'll be pretty sustainable. Um, just to follow up with that. So uh, a bear that's habituated to people um, in the sense of uh, the tourism, I guess most of these places are not near human settlements, but I'm just wondering if there's any relationship with habituating to people in other ways. No, they're, they're just habituated to the fact that the people will be at that location um, and they will, they, they will be doing what, um, you know, we, we do a lot of the viewing from the little uh, inflatable boats, the little zodiacs or tenders. So a lot of times we're just floating around, um, but especially since they've stopped the bear hunting, um, I, I've noticed a considerable difference. There's way less skittishness with bears um, because they don't, they realize that we're not there to shoot them. Um, we do our thing, they do their thing, and it's pretty comfortable on both sides. So there's, there's no food habituating going on. Uh, now, that being said, there is one site um, which is managed by the local First Nation where we can bring our lunch in. And um, that's the only place where I've ever had that experience, but uh, they've been doing that for, I don't know, decades now without incident. So um, it's, it's, it's working fine. Um, we have another question in the chat. Rock turning, crab eating, do they lick them up or hoover them up? <laughs> I, I don't know if I've ever got quite that close. So <laughs> I, I'm, it's, you know, it's, yeah, I don't know. Um, they, they do seem to hoover those roots. Like they're really, their lips are very particular about what they're, because I, I saw that really close, are very particular about what they're taking in with their lips. Um, but I'm kind of guessing they probably lick the crabs up, but. Uh, I'm not a bear biologist. <laughs> um, I've, I've got a question about um, what, what did you call it? Super bear? The one who would do the, yeah, that those were amazing photos. Um, was that a juvenile by any chance? <laughs> was well, that like a teenage boy bear? <laughs> yeah, I, I would say it was what we call a sub-adult. Um, and it was funny because we saw him come down about 10 o'clock in the morning went down to the river, scooped up a fish and ate it. And then it was about two o'clock that he came back. Well, I'm saying he, I don't know what it was. Um, and he started this belly flop after belly flop and didn't catch a single thing. And I don't know if he's just like having fun or, I mean, he did seem to chase around for some fish once he was in the water, but uh, yeah, it was just, uh, we had gone there to see a spirit bear and we didn't see one, uh, but nobody was disappointed because <laughs> we'd had such a good time with super bear. <laughs> Um, any other questions from the group? Oh, me again. When they get the barnacles, do they break the barnacles off with their teeth or with their claws? No, it's with their teeth. Because um, mm -hmm. I've, I've seen this a number of times. And if you're close, I'd, I only, uh, I didn't have my camera the other time I was um, close to a, a barnacle eating bear, but, but they're scraping them off with their teeth and you can hear them crunching. And uh, yeah, to me, it's just like, how much food value is in those little shells? <laughs> yeah. Hmm. But yeah, they, they seem to eat a lot of barnacles. It um, seems to be a big food source. Um, another oh, question. Is, Sorry, go is, ahead. Yeah, with the barnacles, how do their teeth hold up to chewing on what is basically rock? Yeah, I mean, you wonder, don't you? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I haven't uh, looked in that close in the bear's mouth, but it's got to it's got to wear the teeth down. I would I would think um, one of the reasons that the Haida Gwaii bears have the, the well, a they're the biggest of all the black bears, but they're also distinguished by having extra large jaws, and that is specifically designed for eating seafood. Uh, another question from the chat, do our local Victoria bears hibernate? Yeah, the bears on the island, um, 
that sort of have, I, I don't know that much about them, but um, they will get up and walk around during the winter. They, they may not uh, um, tuck in for the whole time. Actually, I don't know if Helen is still with us, but she's like the bear den expert. <laughs> Uh, she wrote in the chat, yes, our bears hibernate. Um, Helen, I don't know if you would like to unmute um, to add anything about uh, the work that you've been doing on bear dens or other, um, if you wanted to weigh in on any anything or share any, any insights. Uh, I won't interrupt the talk. I've been enjoying the poop photos so much and the bear <laughs> fishing photos, <laughs> videos so much. Um, yeah. I, it, the radio colored bears that we had, um, males could den as short as three months, females, because again, they're having their babies in the dens um, up to six months and the females having cubs have to den that long to in order for their cubs to grow large enough to leave. But um, if they have access to a food source, they may come out briefly to a late salmon run or to feed on um, all those fantastic things on the shores like Sherry was showing. Uh, but but they do still den on on Vancouver Island. Thanks, Helen. Um, Sherry, did you ever see any bear dens? Or I guess you're mostly there in the in the summer months. Yeah, I, I haven't. I mean, I guess we've seen. Yeah, there's a couple of times when we've seen something that we we assumed was a bear den. But uh, yeah, uh, lots of day beds. We, we tend to find little day beds. I have a question. I'm just curious. When when the bears are born, when the cubs are born in the dens, do they nurse, uh, or is the mother so dis you know skinny that she doesn't have any milk? No, no, they're they're definitely nursing. Yeah, so she they has are. to have enough fat to get herself and whatever cub she has. Huh. The bears have an interesting thing called um, delayed implantation. So they they breed in the spring, but um, they, they they don't gestate for very long. So if the bear is not in very good shape going into the den, that um, those eggs won't implant. So as long as she's got a, a enough fat, then everything will fall into place and she'll be able to nurse them through the, until the spring. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. I was just wondering, you said that the Haida Gwaii bear are large, Yet in Haida Gwaii, the deer are stunted. Why the difference? Well, I, I don't know. The deer were introduced, so, um, and they certainly seem to have enough food to eat because they're eating everything. Um, yeah, I don't really know the answer to why the deer are small, but I, you know, we have a pretty good idea of why the bears are big because um, they have such a rich seafood diet that they get a lot of calories. Hmm. But that picture I had of the deer just before the bear attack, that was a Haida Gwaii deer. And it was eating that, um, those kelp fronds like spaghetti. It was just kind of inhaling those kelp fronds. It was quite fascinating to watch. I, I have another um, question for you, not about coastal bears, but I just recently heard of a type of bear called a barren ground bear in the Arctic. I think it's a it's a type of grizzly. Or um, have you heard of? Or maybe it's in the that. tundra. Are, are, okay. are, are, you're not thinking of the ones that are interbreeding with the polar bears by any chance, are you? Oh, maybe. Is it the grizzlies and the polar bears that are interbreeding? Yeah. Oh, got, that might be uh, it. We've got a bunch of different names for them. Uh, Pizzly, Growler, Polar Grizz are some of the ones that I've heard. Um, a friend of mine was working in the DNA lab in Nelson that uh, did the first DNA work on, on uh, some of those bears. Thank you. There are uh, barren, barren land grizzlies as well. OK, thank you. Yeah, it's Dave Fraser here, Stephanie. The, um, the barren ground grizzly bears are the ones that follow the caribou migrations. Oh, thanks, Dave. Out of the barren grounds. So um, th they tend to be small, very fuzzy grizzly bears that are tough as nails. They scare the dickens out of me when I'm up in that country. I've never been up in those those parts, so I, I'll, I'll have to look forward to seeing them sometime.
Um, where are most of your tourists from on that come onto your your boats? Are they? Um, did you have a lot more locals during COVID, or did yeah, things stop for you? It's been it's been more local uh, recently, but I, you know I'd still say that um, probably fifty percent of the people that come on the boats are Canadian. Um, with a strong American contingent, and then uh, Australians, Europeans. Um, I've had some people from Hong Kong. Um, yeah, just pretty random, really. Um, but yeah, big North American component. And for all of the naturalists or people who have worked in in uh, parks or interpretation, um, how do you get a job working with these kinds of ecotourism groups and would you recommend it? Um, it it's, it's really great uh, fun. You know, the first time I did it, I went, wow, this is the, the best thing I've ever come up with to make money. <laughs> because you have such a great time and you get, I mean, I say I get paid to go on other people's holidays. Um, but, but yeah, absolutely contact. Um, you know, a lot of us are getting to the point where we're retiring. <laughs> they need uh, some uh, new young blood in um, some of these companies now. So I, I would definitely contact them and uh, um, you know, you might get on just for, for one trip the first year, and then if it goes well, you can get uh, more. And the, the nice thing about it is um, that the two companies that I work for both started out with one boat each, and now they each have three boats, which means lots more opportunities. So um, the whole reason I started working for two companies was I could get more trips that way. And now you can really stay with one company because there's three boats and you can get lots of trips. And then the other company that I work with doing the international tours is um, Quest Nature Tours. That's part of uh, Worldwide Quest. And they, they have uh, really good tours as well. But not, not so much. I mean, they do, they do send people uh, to the coast on some of the trips as well, but they're not, uh, they used to actually charter the boat for it and they're not doing that anymore. Um, any other questions for Sherry? Okay, well, um, big thank you to everybody for, um, for coming and for your patience with my technical difficulties. Thanks so much to, um, to Marilyn and Anne for taking charge. And um, th Sherry, thank you very much for your talk and for all of your great stories and incredible photographs and your knowledge and for sharing with us today. Well, thanks for having me. And I hope everyone has a, has a wonderful evening and um, a great week and month and check our VNHS calendar for all the upcoming presentations and events. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.